Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Insights with Experts. Joining us here today, we are very, very fortunate to have Mr. Andrew Mitson. Now, Andrew is one of the more interesting guests that we've had. Now, I came across him when I was looking at a site called UniRise. I know how to look at this man's achievements and I was absolutely blown away, not just at how much there was in it, but really the range of them. And so Andrew has been in the education space for quite some time. He's lectured at universities such as the London School of Economics. He started up initiatives such as Uplearn, which have been scaled to more than £10 million in value duration. And currently, he finds himself running companies such as UniRise and Instacourse. And just to top everything off, Andrew is also a Forbes 30 under, under, under 30, among various other achievements as well, which I'm not going to spoil, and I'm going to let Andrew actually speak about now. So, Andrew, just to start with, Giles in Singapore, I'm in Melbourne, you're in UK. How is everything in the UK right now? How is everything? I mean, I, I'm doing very well. So firstly, thank you for having me on. Um, I, I'm doing well in the UK. I don't think the UK is, is doing particularly well though. So we are in, I'm not sure what stage of lockdown it is, but everything's closed. Um, you have to wear face masks everywhere, et cetera. And uh, death seems to be on the rise. I just found out my friend has, uh, has COVID. Um, and so I'm getting myself checked uh, tomorrow. So yeah, things aren't, aren't uh, too well in, in the UK. I think they're better in Australia and Singapore though, so. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would say they are, but it's only been like a curve. I mean, to actually get where we are, I mean, everything you're, you're saying sounds exactly what we were about like eight right. weeks ago or something like that. So yeah, so it's kind of like a curve. But um, Andrew, so as I was saying, I, I gave quite like a broad, uh, um, overview. I listed a few points of who you were and so on, and I didn't want to spoil it because now I just want to ask you, like, what did that journey actually look like from founding those companies to you know going into high school, from going into uni? What did that entire thing look like to have you standing where you are now? Yeah, sure, great question. Um, so, but a difficult answer. So, I, I, I suppose things started. Um, my, my journey started when I was around 16. I think that's when things started to get interesting and I, I sort of um, deviated from the known trajectory that most people follow. Um, and so around 16, I decided to drop out of school to work on this uh, product that I was building called the Cable Stable. And basically you could put this device, Cable Stable, on the edge of your desk and clip your wires into place to stop them from falling off the edge of the desk. And I thought this was going to uh, blow up and make me a multimillionaire or whatever the fuck. Um, and uh, none of that happened. Uh, so that left me with about uh, sort of four weeks or something like that to self-study for my A-level exams, um, which I did using kind of YouTube and um, uh, student forums and uh, torrented exam paper websites and things like that. And I ended up getting 98% um, in my A-levels, which were the highest grades in the year. And that's when I recognized, oh, wow, there's, um, there's, some, there's some serious power behind online education. So that got me interested in, in um, the sort of e-learning online education space. Um, and so I got into Cambridge and LSE and then throughout university, um, I was sort of experimenting with different online education ideas. Um, the last idea was Uplearn, um, which I co-founded in my third year at university. So that was like an online learning platform um, to help students self-study their A-levels, much like I did um, when I was 16, 17 years old. Um, so I did that for a couple of years. Um, I was also running a bunch of other weird projects at the time, like uh, Kickstart Global, which is a pre-accelerator program for um, students to start companies. So it's active now in, in London and, and also Singapore, apparently. Um, and... Uh, yeah, that brings me to kind of age 23. Um, so at that point, I was running up learn. I was also running like a DNA fitness and nutrition startup. Um, and I was also, uh, as you mentioned at the start, sort of teaching at, at LSE, uh, behavioral economics. And um, everything kind of just um, imploded for me. And I, I just, it was too much. And it coincided with the uh, passing away of my, my dad. And I was like, man, I've been working so hard, age 16, all the way up until now, um, trying to sort of overachieve, overachieve in all of these different domains. And I hadn't really um, taken any time for myself to explore all of the other things 
um, that life has to offer. So um, since then I've been traveling. Um, so I've been to something like 50 or 60 different countries now. Um, I've learned a bunch of different skills from like French and Spanish to kite surfing and I'm learning the piano right now. And um, yeah, that kind of brings me to, to where I am right now. Um, whereas before I was on a very kind of success oriented um, kind of career path, um, what I'm kind of optimizing for now is uh, I want to live the most interesting life possible. And so I choose projects at work based on how interesting or exciting they are. Um, I choose where to live based on how interesting the culture of that country is. And um, yeah, that's kind of a, a little summary of me in, in a nutshell. Yeah, I think that sounds actually really, really awesome. Um, and, and actually, I think what you picked up on sort of towards the, the latter part of your answer about, um, you know, a lot of people focus in a lot on, on sort of the, the professional success and they, they forget to leave some time for themselves. Um, I think that is quite a, a sort of underrated um, things, thing that people pick up on, you know. Um, there's a lot of advice on how to get somewhere professionally. But um, I think it's really, really cool. So a lot of what you do in terms of self-exploration because the, the value of that isn't as tangible as, as perhaps material success, right? And um, yeah, for anyone sort of listening or watching, I would definitely recommend checking out um, Andrew's website. And it's andrewmitson.co.uk. You can read a yeah. great list of some really interesting things that um, he's been getting up to. Uh, now, for the next question, I wanted to pick up on, on sort of um, what you said earlier about how, you know, you went from a student, a regular student, um, to, to sort of a more online based student. And then you and then you, you were a teacher as well. So your view on the education field is probably particularly, uh, you know, unique because you've been sort of on both sides of, of that same coin. And, um, you know, with COVID students are facing, you know, very detrimental conditions. And so we were wondering, you know, what can, what can a student um, do to sort of mitigate the effects of this? You know, are, are there technical steps that we should perhaps take or is it more of a question around mindset um, and that sort of thing? Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, so two things. Firstly, the detriment that students are experiencing is mm -hmm. social. So they're not able to socialize as they were able to in the past. And actually I was gonna do a master's in computer science this year and I decided to postpone it because I don't wanna be studying computer science uh, online without the option to sort of interact with classmates, et cetera. So the detriment is very much social. I actually think the transition to online learning is in many ways beneficial for sort of um, efficacy of learning and, and learning outcomes. So just sort of for, for context, I've mentioned already that um, with my A-levels, I self-studied all of that content online using YouTube videos. And what that meant is, whereas my sort of classmates were studying in a classroom and they had to keep pace with the teacher, I was able to watch YouTube videos and every time I didn't understand anything, I could just pause the video, I could rewind. Um, if this explanation wasn't working, I could go onto one of these forums and ask a question. And that enabled me to come out of my A-level education with a really deep understanding of the models and the mathematics that I had studied. And when I got to university, I realized that nobody else had um, that sort of uh, strong foundation um, from A-level that, that I had because of the self-studying. And same thing at university, I went to maybe a total of like five lectures across the three years um, that I was studying and I watched everything online, even the lectures that weren't recorded, I got people to uh, uh, take audio recordings of the lectures and then I would uh, listen to those and, and use the lecture slides. So I don't think, um, you know, in-person teaching is especially effective. Uh, often it, it goes too fast and if you can't pause, if you can't rewind, then you're going to miss out on concepts. Um, and, and secondly, there are lots of times where you are um, learning in a classroom and the teacher will say something you don't fully understand and you might want to go off and research that and you just don't have the opportunity to. Whereas learning online, you can do both of those things. Um, and, and I think that's actually very much conducive to a better uh, learning experience. So I don't think it's detrimental at all. And I think um, if you are a student, you know, sort of currently uh, studying at, at university or, or wherever, 
for sure, you should be lamenting uh, your social life. But um, I think on the teaching side of things, um, you should you should sort of see this as an opportunity to actually get a better uh, learning outcome because you can pause, you can research, you can learn more more optimally. I, I saw this thing on, I, th I think it was on LinkedIn. And essentially, at the end of the year, everyone's posting what they learned in 2020, what their thoughts were for like the next year and all that stuff. And Gary Vaynerchuk, um, what he talked about was the word perspective. Right. And he talked about that over and over again. And reason being is because in that year, 2020, all you heard on the media from people from your friends was how horrible everything was at XYZ. And he talked about the, the fact that, uh, I mean, yes, there were things that were horrible, but if you look at it from a, from a certain lens, try to see what was nice about that year as well. And so you're talking about online teaching here in the, in the sense that, yes, there are so many things that are horrible with online teaching. You can't see your friends as a, there's a social aspect. However, if you look at it through another lens, we're looking at what you just talk, talked about there. And um, just before I ask the next question, I want to quickly follow up. And with that, mm. do you potentially think there's a future that, um, you know, we don't even have in-person teaching anymore beyond COVID-19? Um, so there's already been a huge movement towards uh, sort of online degrees and Coursera, for example, recently valued a, a billion plus in, in um you know, the, uh, the online course provider that distributes courses from Harvard, Stanford, et cetera. Um, and yeah, for, for sure, like that I think is a, is a good proof point that you don't need to be in a classroom to learn things. Um, everyone knows that, and, and most students end up doing this anyway. Um, they sort of spend the year bumbling through class and lecture, not really understanding anything, forgetting most of the content that um, is poured into their ears. And then they get to sort of, you know, a couple of months before the exam and they're cramming on YouTube, they're reading their revision books. Like, you know, the whole thing's a bit of a joke, really. Like most people are aware that, um, you know, classroom teaching <laughs> doesn't really do a huge amount. Um, obviously there are exceptions. There are like vocational courses, like medicine that does need to be in person. There's physiotherapy or something like that. Um, but for something like economics, uh, you could very easily get an economics degree um, you know, uh, maybe 30 to 60 hours online watching um, a collection of YouTube videos and, and university lectures. So that's definitely a possible reality. Um, but I think it neglects one really important um, idea, which is university isn't really a place where you're meant to learn. Like when you graduate, very few students actually use what they've learned um, in their future careers. University is a place to socialize and, and have fun. And it's the, the real value of university is it networking effect. It brings together um, students, uh, like-minded students of similar abilities, puts them into one sort of university campus and allows them to have uh, a wonderful time, often involving recreational drugs and, and alcohol, et cetera. So that's the real value um, of university in my eyes. And so I don't think that's going to go anywhere particularly soon, but we might see like more of a hybrid model where I imagine like university tuition fees um, toppling, like they're going to have to come down eventually. It's just way too expensive for the return it currently offers. Um, and, you know, like my co-founder and I have, have plans to eventually open our own university where, you know, you spend three years having amazing time, having discussions and working on projects, things that leverage that in-person experience. And then if you do want to learn something, you can do it very efficiently and very quickly using online resources, but you don't have to pay lecturers 70,000, 100,000 pounds a year to be there lecturing you. So you can carve out a lot of the costs um, and still get, I would say, even, even more of the value if you focus on you know, highly leveraged in-person experiences that make it, take advantage of the university learning environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. Um, and I think this kind of talks into the next question, which we'd like to actually talk about here as well. But um, I think that there, are, there are a few very, very interesting points that you made there in terms of how we learn. Um, and I agree with, I think, 90% of what you were saying in terms of how you learn when you're alone and really what the value of uni is. I mean, many people, Elon Musk, for example, has spoken about it over and over again. He says that, you know, just because you have a degree, I mean, he says that uni isn't a place where you go to learn life skills and so on. I personally think in terms of school and uni, it was those five minute moments just after you entered your class, just before you entered your class where you talked to whoever was teaching 
you talked with your mates, it was that small little social aspect there that really made everything. But yeah. uh, we could talk about that for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> so I'm just going to move on to the next question, which is actually fairly close to what we were talking about here. And at the end, you talked about the fact that uni fees are rising very, very fast. And I think I talked about in an interview we had about four weeks ago, um, stat that I think uni fees have rised to close to 200% in the past yeah. 40 years. But at the same time, real wages have only increased something like 14% in many areas of the world. Now, what, what, what we have here, obviously, is a situation where students are starting to feel things like financial anxiety and so on. And so with yeah. that, to what extent would you advocate the value of uni, not just as something that someone can put on their CV, but as an experience, as something that is, has been up till now viewed at as a major step in a student's life? Yeah, so sorry, just to touch on the first point you made, there's a quote I really like from, I think it's Stephen Fry, and it's that my education is the sum of conversations I had uh, between classes, which I really, which I really loved. Um, and I think it captures a lot of what you were sort of getting at there. Um, so touching on this, this point of uh, whether or not it's still worth it to go to university, um, I, I would still say yes, because I don't know where else you can, you can get that intense, dynamic social life and create those lifelong relationships that so often come out of university. So, and that's extremely valuable. Um, so even if the education isn't, I would say the, the relationship, um, you know, cer certainly is, uh, the relationships certainly are. So um, it's, it's a tricky one. Um, I would, like if I, were, if I were sort of making recommendations to a 17, 18 year old right now, I, I would still recommend going to a, a prestigious, well-ranked university because that degree, regardless of what you actually studied, the degree brand name still carries a lot of weight. Telling somebody that you went to um, Oxford or Cambridge or Stanford or something like that still carries a lot of weight in the, the space of uh, the sort of the career world. Um, and it's a useful sort of stamp of improval. Um, and also, again, that the network that you get from that experience is, is highly valuable and, and highly leveraged. Um, however, if you're unable to get into one of those universities, so for example, if you're uh, in the UK and your only offer is, I don't know, studying business studies at Middlesex University, not to sort of point at a particular degree, it, I, it's now a very difficult, um, I would say a very difficult decision to make um, because it's a lot of money that you're going to be spending, but it's also a lot of time that you're going to be spending to learn very little and you're actually reverse branding yourself. So if you go to a bad university, what you're effectively telling future employers is, hey, I didn't get into a good university. So, you know, the, the idea that university is going to increase your career chances, going to a bad university is going to do the opposite because it's telling employers that I was actually screened out of the good universities um, and that's how I sort of ended up here. So I, I think it's a very difficult decision to make. Um, I would, if I were in that sort of position, um, I would potentially look at, you know, like internship programs, I would look at alternatives like Lambda School is, is really cool where they teach you how to, to code. Minerva is amazing where you get to sort of travel during your degree. Um, potentially look at uh, studying abroad because lower tuition fees in Europe and um, it's also a lot of fun like the Erasmus and the whole vibe there is very different, much less oriented towards academic education, much more socially oriented. So that would be like my, my two cents. I think it's very individualistic. And uh, you mentioned uh, one of my companies, UniRise. Um, that's what UniRise is kind of there to do. It's to uh, give students um, highly personalized advice on, on where they should be applying so they don't end up uh, making dreadful uh, sort of university choices and um, the sort of uh, consequences that, that typically follow. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I actually, I, I like the, the idea about sort of um, picking up on, on which universities are you applying to and that makes probably a big difference in 
at least the people I've talked to, I think it's a, it's an issue that, that, you know, sort of people are now questioning the value of university, but at least the conversations that I've sort of had, a, a lot of people, they either are, you know, very for university, feel very strongly about it, you know, you still need that stamp of approval, whether it be from a, any sort of uh, university, high or low ranking, um, or there are other people who are just sort of, you know, the value of universities is barely um, really justifiable, right? Um, but I, I do like that idea about, you know, if, if you're going to a prestigious university, that stamp of approval actually has a lot of intangible value that, that sort of hides um, and doesn't get the acknowledgement that maybe it deserves. Um, on a slightly different note, um, you know, looking at your website, it's very clear that you've built a sort of pretty impressive list of achievements and you're still continuing that. And, and that goes from everywhere from sort of professionally to in terms of self-exploration. Um, but I think it's, um, at least I feel, people often find it uh, hard to sort of find the fuel, if you will, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, what really motivates you and incentivizes you to, to sort of keep striving for more and pushing? Because I, I, I think a lot of people don't really have that same drive. Yeah, for sure. So. I think there are, it's probably a twofold answer to that question. Um, that's what it deserves. So up until I would say age 23, when I had this kind of burnout episode and everything kind of imploded in my life, a lot of that motivation was actually driven by insecurity. Um, and so I had sort of quite a tumultuous childhood. And so, um, you know, uh, getting a six pack, getting into the top university, getting the highest grades, being financially successful, et cetera. These are all compensation mechanisms um, for uh, actually a, a traumatic childhood where I didn't feel particularly secure. Um, I wasn't sort of super popular at school, et cetera. And so I sort of grabbed at these um, different accolades um, almost as a way to kind of prop myself up and be like, oh, hey, well, you know, I am, uh, I am confident, I am successful, I am capable, et cetera. Um, and then when I got to 23 and I finally had sort of ticked off all the, the boxes, um, I realized, okay, well, you know, I've got, I've sort of done those things and I'm still um, kind of searching. I'm still not uh, fully content, et cetera. Um, my motivation changed dramatically. So there was a period of about six months where I had absolutely no motivation. And I, I want to be um, yeah, very honest about this because I think often when you look at quote unquote, uh, successful people or relatively successful people, um, you assume that they are constantly productive and always switched on. And, and that's definitely not the case. So I, I've had, uh, you know, several month long periods in my life where I've been like totally off. Um, after this burnout episode, there was this six month period where I had absolutely no idea um, what to do with my life. And so I was traveling to different countries, kind of searching for answers in, in books and talking to people. Um, and what I've arrived at actually, and this is kind of how I've been living my life the last two years is, um, what I really enjoy learning new things. And so I am trying to optimize my life around learning as many new interesting things as possible. And so it's not like this compulsive drive to be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna learn French so I can impress this girl. Or um, it, it's, it's very much just, you know, actually I find the French language fascinating. And so I, I enjoy French film. And so I'm, I'm going to watch <laughs> French movies and, and talk to French people to improve my uh, French ability. Um, and the same in sort of the, the career, uh, career world. So uh, with UniRise, for example, um, I very strongly believe that university students deserve more access to honest information about what university is really like. Um, because as I sort of mentioned earlier, it's not this clear return on investment. It's actually very murky and ambiguous. And a lot of students, uh, you know, don't get a return on the 30, 40,000 pounds they spend at university. So again, that was something I was just interested in doing. And, and so I, uh, so I did it. So in terms of like, um, you know, if you're struggling with, with motivation, one thing I would uh, sort of maybe examine is are you doing things that you're actually interested in? Like, it sounds extremely obvious, but um, there's, there's some real truth here. Like if you're forcing yourself um, to complete an economics degree when you don't care about economics, and I was surrounded by a lot of these people at university, 
you're going to find it really hard to complete your economics degree. Um, whereas if you're studying, I don't know, biology and you love biology, um, you'll find it relatively uh, easy. So um, I, I feel like a lot of people are rushed by society to prematurely optimize. Um, and so they, they make decisions about what they're studying, what career they're going to get into, what relationship they're going to get into prematurely, too early, um, without fully exploring the options. And so, you know, if you're, if you're not enjoying what you're doing and you're struggling with motivation, perhaps take a step back and kind of re-explore your, your options and, um, you know, find something that, that really interests you and gets you through. Um, yeah, that would be my, my answer to that one, yeah. Right, yeah, and I was actually supposed to follow on with a question in terms of how someone else can actually find that for you, but I think you've more or less answered everything there. So I want to switch the question over actually, specifically when you had that change in mindset, when where you went from all right, six success from a monetary standpoint, from doing certain things to, you know, impress other people or so to really having this kind of self fulfillment happiness instead. And what have you found so far in terms of like your well being, in terms of your like state of mind and so on? How have you found, I mean, how, yeah, how have you found that that's really helped you moving on to this new vision on life where instead, you know, you're seeing things through that lens of experiences through self fulfillment and so on. I, I can't even put it into words. Like it, it's tremendous. Like the, the sort of step change in, in your happiness from um, where I was uh, kind of just before I, I decided to go off exploring. Um, and I was kind of, <laughs> to, you know, popping caffeine pills in the morning just to get through the day. And, um, and then now where everything just kind of flows and um, it's not like a, this isn't a permanent state. So even just uh like uh, October, November last year were, were quite difficult months for me. Um, but that was because I was sort of ignoring some of my core values and I wasn't exploring to the extent that, um, you know, my sort of true self desires. Um, and so right now where I'm in a position, uh, you know, like my day from literally wake up to, to go to sleep is constant learning and exploration. So, I cook a new meal every single day. Um, I'm learning the piano and then the guitar and then my Netflix is all in French, so I'm learning French. Um, I read before I sleep. I have interesting conversations with people. I do like acro yoga and weird shit like that. To, so it, it's like, yeah, my, with my current life, I find um, deep, deep satisfaction. And um, almost, again, like this motivation question, it always seems absurd to me right now because it's like, <laughs> why would I need to be motivated? I'm enjoying these things. And obviously that's not always the case, like, you know, working out in the morning, you do need systems as, as, as well. And uh, maybe we can talk about that later on, but um, yeah, definitely uh, it, it's been a, a huge um, leap in terms of my well-being, And that's why I would so strongly encourage people to take a gap year or, you know, pay less attention at university and spend more time kind of self-exploring, experimenting with things, try and find the things that, that really make you happy, that bring you to life. And once you found those things, literally just design your life around um, those, those set of uh, things, ideas, whatever they might be. And uh, you know, that's a pretty surefire way to, to be happy and fulfilled. Yeah, I think I, I love that. And I think it's, people have become so focused um so i mean just for some context i'm i'm still in high school um yeah. and i look at my peers around me and, and so many people are focused on just getting through the grind um and, but they don't stop to sort of ask any questions about what they're doing or whether they're really enjoying it and um yeah i definitely agree that a lot of people have to sort of take that step back um so taking a look uh, at the sort of current goals that you're working toward they they work there there are a range of things you know a really wide range of things and and it's really awesome um so from sort of animation to to psychedelic experiences right um yeah the my question was sort of why have you immersed yourself in such a broad range of experiences as opposed to sort of specializing in a particular field or, or niche yeah so it's like uh if you can kind of conceptualize like an interestingness curve, um, what tends to happen is, is when you first start exploring a new subject, uh, things get very interesting very quickly. 
Um, and then, you know, at some point you reach a saturation point. So for example, I spent three months learning Spanish and I got to a really good level where I could fluently converse with, with locals, et cetera. Um, and then I decided to do another one and a half months learning Spanish in, in Mexico. And just, that, yeah, I, I found things getting progressively less interesting. And it got to a point where, you know, I would watch an entire Spanish movie and I wouldn't learn anything new about um, the language. And it's at that point that I realized, okay, cool. Well, I'm going to continue watching these movies um, because they're interesting, um, as in the content of the movies, but I'm not going to continue sort of uh, learning Spanish or trying to cram Spanish vocabulary or learn Spanish grammar rules um, in that same way because. I've kind of reached um, the apex almost of, of the learning curve and actually um, going beyond this point, things are kind of getting quite dull. I'm now getting into very kind of abstract, boring uh, grammatical rules and um, strange words like, uh, you know, wh whatever um, that I, I don't particularly want to learn, words I didn't even know in, in English a lot of the time. So um, that's, you know, so, so that's why I like to kind of diversify my interests and um, I also think, you know, there's this misconception that you need to spend a lot of time to get good at some uh, particular skill, like there's this 10,000 hour rule that's often uh, batted around the internet. Uh, what I found is, you know, you can get pretty fucking good at a skill in, you know, three to six months. Um, you can get proficient in a skill in about 30 days. So um, pushing it beyond that, unless, you know, you're really interested in, in mastery, um, it can often be, a, it, it, yeah, it's usually at odds with my goal of kind of uh, living an interesting life and, and things get quite boring when you get into like the really granular detail. It can also sometimes get really, really interesting when you get into um, super depth. So it depends on the subject, but um, that's been my kind of personal uh, finding in a lot of, uh, and that's why I've tried to kind of diversify my, my interests. Yeah. Yeah. yeah fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I, I really agree with that uh, sort of approach actually. And, and um, the sort of, law of diminishing utility right um it, it is definitely true and and especially in sort of learning things you can learn things very quickly but um as you move closer toward that sort of degree of mastery um things do sometimes get a little bit more boring and i i just had a quick follow-up on that which is you know uh, high school students for example like myself you know the system has it anyway that will go on and do degrees in, in whatever subjects we we choose so, you know, what if I'm sort of scared that I'll, you know, right now I'm interested in say computer science and I'm quite passionate about it, but what if I go on into university and a year in I'm, I've, do, I've reached this new degree of sort of depth in computer science and, and things are getting progressively less interesting, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, so firstly that's why I, I i get so frustrated with the education system especially in the uk yeah. so much focus on these singular degrees where you learn one subject for three years so you know i spent three years learning economics that could have been crammed into like the useful information there could have been crammed into three four months at, at best um and the rest of it was kind of you know fluff really um and uh yeah i mean unfortunately there's no particularly good solution to that except i would say yeah like first you can look for liberal arts degrees so applying to the us for example um that's very possible but even in the uk exeter has like a flexible combined honors program so you could study computer science with english literature and that kind of keeps things more variable it also keeps your options more open if you will um you could look at like bachelors of arts and sciences at, at ucl which my co-founder did um, where he studied like um, all sorts of weird things like French and then psychology and then economics and then geography. And, and that seemed like a very sort of entertaining uh, way to get to your degree. Um, but let's suppose you do just go decide to go down a uh, like a linear uh, computer science path. Um, you know, like you can still you can still sort of choose modules, I would say, that um, kind of uh, push boundaries a little bit and um, enough, take yeah you know, sort of off the linear beaten path. Um, and, you know, there are always optional modules that you can choose. Um, and I think there's also like a, an extent to which you can shift your attitude around things. So um, you can try and find things to be interesting. So you can get curious about things. And actually sometimes uh, that leads you to get into real detail about something and that can be really exciting too. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, Andrew, I think we're about to approach the end of our interview yeah. now. And just 
before I ask you this last question, it's a classic question, the exact same one we ask literally everyone that comes on here. I would just first like to thank you for actually hopping on, having this entire talk. I think uh, Joel can agree that we've learned quite a lot. Uh, specifically, yeah, it's been interesting to like re rethink the entire, you know, way we measure success, the way we measure fulfillment and so on. But um, really, what this last question is, is if you could just leave the youth with one piece of advice, what would that one piece of advice actually be? Yeah, so I, I think it, it will go back to something I said earlier, which is don't prematurely optimize. So don't, don't um, uh, sort of overinvest too early into a pursuit when you, you're not sort of confident that it's, it's going to turn out the way you want. Um, so spend some time experimenting. You know, if you're interested in law, go work at a law firm for a few months. Talk to uh, lawyers who are 30, 40 years old. Work out if that's something that would really interest you and try and be sort of realistic with yourself. Is this something that you could, uh, you know, honestly jump into um, sort of full time? So um, spend some time exploring. Don't feel pressured by society to jump into things. Gap years, et cetera, definitely recommended. Thanks for listening in. This podcast has been brought to you by Desera, a platform designed to bridge the gap between the youth and professionals. You can read more about us at desera.org. And you can also check out the section titled Insights with Experts, where you can submit your questions that you might have for future experts and industries that you would like to learn more about. And you can also refer in any experts that you might know yourself.